So there's there's a ways to go. Yeah, in a, in a way, you're right. I mean, it's um, they actually don't even need taxes in order to fund the system. I mean, they have the ability to print money out of thin air, and they've been doing that. Um, but it gives them a gateway, a, a, a mechanism of control, the likes of which um, – they couldn't get anywhere else. I mean, they get total control of your finances, the ability to have um, 100% information about where your money comes from, um, you know, where your money goes, and the ability to take all of your property and put you in jail if you make any mistakes on their for their paperwork. Um, so, yeah, I, I, you're you're right in the sense that it, it, the motivation could be more than just the money. It's it's it's, it's control. Um, because, yeah, I mean, there's people who've proposed. I mean, he's talked about the fact that we, we've been we were running the United States um, up until 1913 with absolutely no income tax. It didn't even come into, into being until 1913. So, how were they running the country? They were doing it somehow. Yeah, that's a, that's a major shift in paradigm that we have to bring people to, which is that yeah, no longer is external um, man-made law a point of reference. We can't look at it as a point of reference because it is the the, the mechanisms for creating law are totally controlled by a, a mafia of criminals, literal criminals, men who kill people for money, who you know steal massive amounts of wealth for their own benefit. Um, when these guys are writing the laws, which they are, um, you, you, you have to just be, you have to get to the point when you realize, okay, maybe in the current context I have to be slightly aware of the law so I don't break the law in front of a cop so that they put me in jail. But for, for every point of reference that counts you know, for what I, for what is morality and for what we're going to actually work towards, we just have to throw all that out at this point because it's gotten so complicated, so just bizarre and so exactly, exactly opposite of morality at this point. Um, it's like, it's like a, a, a termite infested house. It's, you know, you reach this point where it's just beyond the point of no return. Um, and that's that's going to be difficult for people, and that's where we have to really work on these fundamental principles of responsibility, of take, of, of understanding morality w- or understanding ethics without uh, an external point of reference, without religion dictating it to you, without the the law dictating it to you. Just just to use the logic and self evident reality. I mean, when you just see cause and effect and understand, okay. If I do this, it causes pain and suffering and, uh, to, to another person. Therefore, that's not okay. That's wrong. Um, if you don't use that as your point of reference, then just about any law can pass because people will say, okay, well, the law says that we need to do this. So, okay, um, well, that's great. You know, well, the Bible says um, you can kill little babies um, you know, if they come from a, a culture that doesn't believe in a Judeo, Judeo God. So, that's okay. I guess we can do it, you know, with the Native Americans. Um, you know, that's that's what people. There's a, a major amount of work that has to be done getting people to realize that a lot of the, the so-called morality that we've been handed is actually evil. Well, I think that you have to work on the fundamentals first. I mean, there's obviously going to be a lot of contradictions on the surface that we just don't have any control over, um, and it, you know. To focus on the surface elements could actually be counterproductive because, you know, for instance, if you say, I'm not going to use computers because computers have contained elements that come from Africa, then you won't be able to, to work on changing those fundamental um, concepts that would actually lead to, in the long term, um, a shift in the way that we deal with industry, the way we deal with, you know, resources and that, that kind of thing. Um, we have to get people operating ethically on the areas that they do control in, the, in their lives, you know, to be, to re- to be realizing to be taking responsibility for their their sphere of control of action right now, um, and that's hard. I think that's that's the fundamental difficulty because everyone is comfortable with you know pointing out the wrongs of someone else and saying, okay, yeah, they're the blame, they're the, they're the, the culprit. Um, like you were saying, it's you know when you bring it back, okay, well, how did my part in this contribute? You know, how, how did how is the machine dependent on me? How is the machine dependent on my family? Um, and how can, the, you know, with, within reason right now, um, without getting myself thrown into jail, or you know, maybe involving getting myself thrown into jail, um, to what degree am I willing to, be, to act on what I already know? Um, 
and in a, obviously that that question is not something that anyone can answer for you. I mean, no one. Can, it's not within my realm to be able to tell someone, "Go get yourself thrown in jail." I personally wasn't willing when they when they came after me. I left the country. I wasn't willing to to to, to go to prison to make a point. Um, I don't think it would have served any any positive purpose. Um, yeah, you know, but when it, if 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 it had happened at a different time, it had, if it had happened when the momentum was already there, when it was already established that yes, we are a unified block of fifty percent of the population, and we are going to resist right now, yeah, then I would have said it was worth it. Um, and that's that's what people need to come to terms with. What's the, what's the appropriate action now? And I think you know, right now, a, a big part of the, what the appropriate action is is to build that momentum, to build that unity between the left and the right. Um, you know, to get people to stop fighting among themselves on these these petty political issues that we're never going to agree on. You know, obviously, people who agree with abortion and people who are against abortion are not going to reconcile those differences, um, and that's why they keep bringing those things to the political front. At least in the United States, I know it's not it's not even an issue in places like France or um, you know England, but in they have other issues. They'll make they use other issues. They'll use whatever issue is unresolvable to make that the center of attention um, to keep people uh, disputing, to keep people fighting. And if you can get people to, to have enough maturity to say, okay, hold on, hold on. I know we don't see eye to eye on this. Let's put this aside because there's something much, much more important. You know, we we absolutely have to avoid going into World War III. We have to avoid an outright hot war between the United States and China. Well, I think historic, history will define this entire era that we're in right now as the beginning. Um, but it's hard to get people to recognize that. And I, I mean, I've talked about it um, to some degree, that, yes, we already are in, in a war. It's just a question of, of, of how it gets defined um, in the long term. Because if you look you know, at World War II, uh, we understand now that, um, that, the, uh, that the way that uh, Hitler provoked and um, created that false... Um, attack with was it Hungary? I believe. Am I, am I correct with that? Poland, Poland. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, but th- basically, faking that encroach, encroachment by Poland, um, uh, that was the beginning. And you know, but people, people didn't see it then. People didn't see it for years. Um, it wasn't a world war while it was starting. It was a world war after you know the United States, England, and um, the rest of the world officially through their weight behind it. Um, and right now we're in you know, a huge number of countries in the Middle East. We're destabilizing countries all over the place. Um, and there's a financial war that's unfolding right now where you know China and Russia made agreements among themselves to pull off the dollar. You have agreements that are being established between Iran and India. Um, the, the, the alliances are forming. The, 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 the lines are being, being drawn. And the United States... Is, is intentionally provoking these countries. I mean, if you look at what they did in um, the last couple of weeks where they, they actually um, killed something like 20 um, Pakistani soldiers using a, a drone strike, I mean, it's only through a, a massive amount of self-restraint that that isn't leading into a hot war right now. I mean, can you imagine if, if that was in, in, uh, somewhere in Europe that the United States just flew a drone strike and killed 20 soldiers? I mean, what would have happened if that? I mean, it happened. Or what would have happened if it had been China that had flown a drone strike in the United States? I mean, the United States wouldn't have stood by and watched that to happen. That would have been war like that. They're holding back. The rest of the world is holding back because there's they don't want to go into this. They do not want World War Three. Um, the United States does. That's pretty clear. I mean, there's no, there's no way you can attack this many countries. You know, like right now, they're talking about going to Syria. They just got through taking out Libya. Um, you know, the the obvious connection, the obvious next step with Syria is Iran, because Iran is, has um, you know, mutual defense agreements with Syria. So when they if they go into Syria, it's going to I mean it's, Iran is going to have to make a decision whether they defend the country that they pledge to defend. So I mean, if they if they don't want a, new, a war to to, to unfold between the um, United States and, and China, they're doing everything backwards because China has clearly said that they, they'll defend Pakistan and we've been encroaching into Pakistan. Um, so the moment when one of these countries goes, okay, enough's enough, 
that's when the people are going to have to recognize it. That's when it's going to be unavoidable. Um, but, you know, I don't think people are going to fully realize it until the first nuclear bomb flies. Well, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, that's, that's one of those kind of dis- discussions where you, you – it's definitely something to talk about in, in philosophical circles. What, I, what I've done – what I've had to real, realize um, is that I have to deal with things in pragmatic terms um, when I'm dealing with the public. For instance, for a long time, I would re- refuse to say good and evil you know, because I would always frame things in terms of consequences. You know, this, because at the highest level, when you understand that everything is um, – one totality, then yeah, you know, the word evil is kind of it's kind of BS. But people don't understand that. It's just it, we're dealing with a population that has it's operating on let's say a third grade level when, when you're talking about this total morality, and, and those are like college level concepts. Um, you know, for people to get to that point, yes, in a certain context, people need to be discussing these higher truths. I mean, I do think it's important, um, but at the same time. Um, if you mix it too much in, in, in within a single discourse, people aren't going to be able to follow you, and they're not going to be able to, to, to grasp the, the immediate um, danger, the, the immediate, the immediate um, import of what you're talking about. Um, and that's that's kind of a, a, a struggle. It's kind of one of those things that, that I've been having to work on myself because it's it's a constant um, – I constantly have to, to restrain my tendency to want to go – to bring into it, to bring in these other um, higher level concepts because yes it is important um, but but it's it's a question of what is it strategically effective well it's it, like I said it's not necessarily you know the number of views that makes all the difference I mean it's I mean even you know, Bill O'Reilly's got a following um, but it's I've been paying attention you know there's a lot of people who go out on on, on these kinds of channels and and they they attempt to do what is emotionally satisfying or what they want to be doing, and what I've been trying to do because I really do feel that this is absolutely crucially important that we succeed in this is I've been trying to look at what works, what doesn't work, and to adjust accordingly to be looking at okay, I might have said exactly what needed to be said in this video. This is true. This is what you know. This is it right here, but people couldn't handle it because it it, it hit hit the button just a little bit too hard, just a little bit too directly. Um, so, so it is basically shut out. You know, they're like, oh, I can't, I can't listen to that. And, you know, even some videos, some of the videos that were the most, you know, clear and obvious to me would lead to 300 people subscribing in a day, just like that. Um, un- unsubscribing, I mean. So, I mean, and that's, you know, as much as I want to say, I don't care if you unsubscribe or unsubscribe, actually I do. You know, to be perfectly honest, I do want people to listen. If I was, you know, if, if anybody who says they don't want people to listen is it, it, blowing smoke up, 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 up your ass. Because I mean, if they didn't want people to listen, they wouldn't be putting out their YouTube channel. They wouldn't be putting themselves out to the public. Well, exactly. But how do you get people to do that? I mean, even that, like, like to get to get that message, to get the message. And I, I try to put that out there too, as much as I can. Make videos, go out there, speak your mind, do it. Um, but and even even to get people to hear that message, you have to be have people listening. Um, so it's a – yes, I want people to listen. I want people to listen because I want people to change. Um, and that's the thing that a lot of people – it's kind of a taboo in society. You, like you shouldn't try to change people. Well, actually, yes, we need to be trying to change people. We have very little time. You can be polite. You can be civil about things. But when we have war at stake. We have people dying right now. And in the United States, the United States is actively – Killing people in multiple countries right now. You know, this is not a theoretical in the future kind of thing. It's going on right now, and, and the preparations for the next war are underway. So, it, it, NATO is the Axis powers of, of World War Three. Um, you know, if you look at not to go down a rabbit hole, but if you really look at what happened after World War Three, there was basically an exportation of of, of Nazi leaders into the United States. <laughs> Um, and they were taken directly into the CIA. And this is well documented. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is, you know, you, well, exactly. I mean, yeah, there's a, a number of them went down to Uruguay and Uruguay and other thing. But the ones that um, got in, in position in the CIA, those are the ones that are the most dangerous because that's within the, uh, the secret mechanisms that we don't have any accountability for. I mean, who knows what they did after that? 
I mean, what's really interesting, if this is a rabbit hole, but um, there's a number of, of U.S. military buildings that are, are designed in the shape of a swastika. That, you know, a long time for a long time people didn't know about it, but now that we have Google Earth, we can go and look right on them and see that they've built these, you know, Navy bases in the shape of swastikas. So they're they're firmly established in the American military system. 